All right. Thank you very, very much for coming back. We are really going to into our final panel here, which is almost the most exciting part of it, because we will have a presentation to talk about not only Africa and beyond. What is happening in terms of your ability to actually move forward with that UN resolution? And then after the panel speaks, we're going to invite you at home to send in your questions so that we can give the panelists a chance to answer them live here. And those of you who are in the room, I made the request to everybody here, think of a question because we're gonna hand you a microphone you're gonna ask to ask a question. All right, so be prepared, all right? So we're gonna go to our panel to talk about Africa and beyond. What is it that's taking place and how is the UN resolution gonna help with that? Hello, Durham Wall Rieger, Chair of Rare Diseases International, and welcome to our second session from um, our conference here in Dubai. We're going to be focusing now on the future opportunities for rare diseases in Africa and beyond. Those of you who have been, were with us earlier will know that we've got um, five of our panelists that are coming back, and then we've added on three additional guests. So just um, to repeat, we've got Rana Saifi, who is the Regional Manager, Eastern Mediterranean for World Federation of Hemophilia. We've got Rosalind Kanja and Christine Mutina, who are co-founders of Rare Disorders Kenya, Samuel Waifi, who is the executive director for Rare Disease Ghana Initiative, and Kelly Duplessis from Rare Diseases South Africa. We also are adding onto the panel Carmencita Padilla, who is the chair of the Philippine Society for Orphan Disorders, Roberta Anido de Pena, who's the president of the Argentinian Federation of Rare Diseases, and also Laura Bloom, who is president and CEO of the Earler Dandler uh, Society. Welcome to all of you. And I think this is going to be an amazing conversation to really talk about some of the challenges and opportunities that are taking place within your locales. But quite importantly, we're going to bring in the United Nations declarations on rare disorders and also how you've been able to help support it, what you're anticipating, you're going to be able to expand in terms of your work with it, and how also you feel that you're going to be able to contribute to the, uh, the work that is outlined in the uh, UN declaration. So let me start with uh, our new panelists that we've included here, and maybe I'll go immediately to you, Carmen. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about, you know, what is your role uh, within the uh, society and what was your motivation? Why did you get involved in terms of doing what you're doing there? I'm a clinical geneticist and I've been working with, uh, with patients with rare diseases um, for decades. And finally, we had to get together with professionals and parents to set up the Philippine Society for Orphan Disorders. My specific role has been helping them get the, the, the legislation in place so that in 2016, we were able to have a law, the Rare Disease Law of 2016, and hopefully this will provide a framework for the, for the care of the patients with rare disorders in the Philippines. Thank you so much. And your work actually has really had a huge influence right across the whole Asia Pacific region. So thank you. Now I'll pivot over to Roberta, who also is, in fact, she's from Argentina, but also again, the work that you're doing in Argentina has had a huge influence, I think, in, in uh, the other Latin American countries. So Roberta, your motivation for being uh, involved in rare disorders, and what do you see as you know some the important you know work that the contribution from the uh, Argentina Federation. Well, all start 20 years ago when I began the odyssey of reaching a diagnosis for my eldest daughter, who, had, who was diagnosed in 2001 with a common variable immunodeficiency, a primary immunodeficiency. So that was the day was beginning all the new path for my life and for my family, because as you know, the impact of rare diseases diagnostic is uh, not so easy to accept and also to adjust to a daily life because living uh, with a rare disease as a family, you have to face very difficult uh, challenges and, and big challenges on a daily basis. That includes all the aspect of the human life, but uh, that's why as a, as a, um, our work in, as an umbrella organization, 
uh, we work with more than 20, uh, eight, 84 uh, members, organizations of different rare diseases in my country. We have about uh, 3,6500,000 patients in Argentina that needs to have an early diagnosis, an adequate treatment, and a full life. So our mainly work is at national level, but also we maintain, obviously, alliance at regional and international level to enhance not only our work, but also uh, the work of our members. Wonderful. We'll come back to some of that expanded work because it really has had a huge impact. Laura, you're in a somewhat different position because you are, in fact, the president of uh, the society and, and not necessarily localized, though you do obviously do local work. Maybe just introduce kind of your motivation for getting involved and what do you see as the um, as the primary uh, issue that would be for, for the Earl's Daniel Society? Absolutely. I've been working in this space now for about 12 years, and I originally started uh, running the UK organisation EDS UK, and we realised very quickly that working on a national level wasn't breaking down the fragmentation and the silos that we saw in the EDS world. And so in 2015, we launched what is now the global organization, the Adders Danos Society. And it's been incredible how much more we've been able to achieve in that short space of time since coming together through that global lens than we have done in the decades before. So my motivation originally was as a patient who waited 12 years for my diagnosis. And what we're hoping is as we're coming together, we can reduce those diagnostic times and make access to management and care more local, consistent and long term. Thank you so much. So I'm going to stick with you three for the moment and we'll give you a chance maybe to introduce some of the challenges specifically within your region. And Laura, I'm going to ask you to start thinking about sort of, you know, Mediterranean African region as well, because I know you do a broad scope of work, but really we want to talk a little bit about um, some of this region, uh, maybe to you, uh, but also, you know, internationally, I think you work in a lot of different, um, you know, with a lot of different uh, patient groups in other countries, so beyond Africa as well. But so Carmen, let me ask you again, what do you see, what were the key challenges that you faced in, in the Philippines in terms of trying to introduce the legislation? What was the political climate like? What was the healthcare professional climate like? and maybe what kind of uh, alliances you have with the patient community to get moving, because it's been monumental, the work that you've done in terms of getting in the legislation. Uh, the, the basic problem in the Philippines is that we are a low and middle income country, which means we have a lot of challenges even getting into the priority of government, the health ministry. So getting into the their attention was difficult because we have other problems like pneumonias, diarrheas, and so on. So together with other professionals and the patients, we put together the society and we lobbied together. So the lobby actually was very important uh, with patients and professionals coming together. But the, the legislation primarily provides a complete framework. And um, after all this wait, uh, I think finally now we're preparing the roadmap for the next five years as hosted by the government. But my bigger challenge right now really is the funding because it's not enough that we have legislation. I have to make sure that funding is provided by government in collaboration with the private sector. So I'd say it's really competing with priorities of the government is the most critical point in, in the Philippines. Certainly, as you say, I mean, it's not even just low and middle income countries, but when you're talking about countries where, in fact, um, the investment in healthcare may be quite challenging and competing with other priorities and also then getting the um, the support for rare diseases may be especially daunting. So thank you very much for that. Roberta, over to you. And I mean, Argentina has had a... Um, a rare disease policy for a long time, but obviously that wasn't a free pass in terms of getting all kinds of government supports, nor was it a free pass in terms of getting all the healthcare professionals there. Tell us a little bit about the environment that you've been working in and maybe sort of the, the key things that you've had to do in order to be able to mobilize um, support for rare diseases in Argentina and, you know, and maybe a bit beyond. Well, it's not so far what... Uh, Carmen Cita Padilla told, you know, we have in Argentina, we, we our work is focused uh, as a local level. We have a national law since 2011, but despite this, many times the law is not enforced as it should be. So unfortunately, unfortunately sometimes we have to go to court. So uh, we also have um, a national rare disease program 
that in effect is not have a, a good uh, action plan with the, a really improvement of the of the reality that face uh, people living with rare diseases. And since last year, we have a list of rare diseases and a registry of uh, people living with rare diseases. This is all new. Uh, all these achievements, of course, were in part as a result of our pers persistent joint work with, uh, from the Federation with the Ministry of Health. But we know that uh, we have to do a lot of work and, and most of the, the thing we need to do is to improve our resources map to know where are the specialists, uh, to have more specialized centers care, and not only to advocate our community and uh, our national members, but uh, our greatest achievements uh, in is our, is our continued work in public policies, because this is our roadmap, the way that we could achieve uh, a collective uh, goal for all the people living with their diseases and their families. Thank you so much. I'm going to come back to both of you because you talk about the legislation that does exist, but obviously the huge challenges that still exist in terms of getting any of that legislation enacted, or as you say, Roberta, into um, action plans. But Laura, maybe I'll go to you and I mean, taking a wide scope, and but maybe focusing a bit on terms of low middle income countries. What have you seen, you know, in the, as an international society has been the kinds of opportunities and challenges and does, as you said, being an international society, help when we get to local levels in terms of some of these countries where health services for rare diseases is just emerging? Well, I think the first thing to say is I can say with conviction that nowhere has it perfect. Um, you think in the kind of progressed US, Europe, UK, um, those in um, the kind of lower middle income countries always think that's where they should go for that best quality care. And it's not there. Um, it's not there really anywhere. It's better, certainly. But what we're finding is that, and I've said this many times, that the healthcare systems, they're set up for the acute um, and, and not the rare and the chronic and the long term. So when people are getting diagnosed, their, their therapies and the care that they need is not being given for the rest of their lives. It's being given short term in six to eight weeks. Um, and that's just not helpful. And the education and the minutiae behind caring for a rare disease patient and taking in that full multi-systemic picture is really what's missing throughout. And I think that ranges from those countries where they're lucky to even have an expert in, in their area to, to get their diagnosis, to them ranging from somewhere like the US, the UK, where they get their diagnosis, but then going back to where they live, there's no one that really understands it. I had an experience this weekend in the UK with private health insurance. You may be able to see I have black eyes behind here at the moment. I had a straightforward procedure to remove some things from my eyes. But with EDS, you're, you don't react to local anesthetic. So what just the lack of knowledge and understanding makes something very straightforward into a very traumatic experience for a patient. And, and it's those kind of things that make the journey and the experiences of treatment and therapies that is seen consistently throughout. And I think the only way to improve that has to come from the, the real foundations of education and awareness that is still not perfect anywhere. So perfect, you're saying, you know, the local access, the, you know, and the local knowledge is still quite, um, you know, uh, it, variable depending on, you know, where you are. So let me go then in, in, over to you, Rana, because I mean, again, you sit in the, you know, in an international spot, but really having focus in terms of Northern Africa, Mediterranean as well. What do you see as maybe some of the particular challenges that are in this this well, very fairly broad region, and maybe connected to, you know, uh, income levels, but maybe connected to other things because there are some, you know, countries within there that may not be only, you know, dealing with the kind of socioeconomic issues. I think, you know, what we've seen is that where progress has has happened, it has not been linear. So there are ups and downs uh, throughout the the journey of trying to make both the diagnosis, the access to treatment, the prioritization of rare bleeding disorders up on the agenda of decision makers. This, this takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of perseverance. It takes a lot of patience. But it also takes something extremely 
crucial, which is strong country level leadership. That is really a, a make it or break it element. We see it here with the people around the table, Carmen Chita, Roberta, Lara, leading those efforts. It's those kinds of individuals that have been able to convince decision makers, policy makers to put rare breathing disorders up on the agenda, whether it's through legislation, Samuel as well, through um, treatment, through diagnosis. That is one of the key, key elements. I cannot stress it enough. You know, when you have a strong leader, things move, but they do not move in a linear fashion. The other thing is uh, governance of the patient organizations, where uh, the patient organizations have been advanced enough to organize and create their own patient group. They need to build a strong institutional foundation with a solid a board of directors, sometimes where possible, a solid medical and scientific advisory committee. They need to know the direction of travel. They need to ensure that they have succession plans that make them more effective and resilient. So if the leader leaves tomorrow, the whole thing doesn't collapse. And, and, and these are the elements that help them regroup faster post-crisis and the crisis in a lot of countries we work with are numerous, you know, they can be economic, they can be political, they can be COVID related, they can be anything, you know, so you need strong leadership, strong organizational um, foundations. And then I think one other thing uh, that was um, mentioned already by Lara, and I cannot stress it enough, which is the education knowledge and capacity building. I mean, this is really the end all and be all. Uh, education mm -hmm. is what helps break taboos. And I'm sure we'll come to the whole uh, question of stigma later. And it is the patients that understand their own issues that can take better care of themselves, but that can also create those support networks for others. And it's those um, knowledgeable healthcare professionals that can provide that early and accurate diagnosis and timely care. And, and both working together can be better advocates and better influences. Great. Thank you so much, Raina. Well, speaking as you and you know have said in terms of having champions and having those kind of champions on the ground, um, maybe it's my perfect opportunity to pivot over to Samuel. Um, I mean, Samuel, you, you're a bit like uh, Carmen Sita in being in a position where you've got, you know, certainly a strong presence in the healthcare community, but also a real passion in terms of the rare diseases and also working very much so, you know, with the patients and families on the ground. So can you sort of maybe help us understand kind of what's been your, you know, kind of a, a strategy, I guess it may, it may not have been a form strategy story for getting into, you know, the uh, the policy area and into the uh, the actual, you know, system practices area. What, what have you been able to do here? Speaking from your position, uh, somebody who is, you know, both a professional, but tied to the patient community. Yes, uh, uh, it's, it's, Thank you, thank you. It's about understanding uh, the, the need clearly, uh, uh, understand that the rare disease issues uh, for low middle income countries uh, uh, for policymakers may not just be uh, just a decision to take, but also have to understand the as Kamasita uh, 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 rightly said uh, them other priorities that exist in the country and 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 being able to offer uh, some form of a solution and that is what uh, we uh, were able to uh, not just say this is what the family needs this is this is but being able to uh, show uh, bringing all the stakeholders that uh, uh, needs to be on the table that is being able to bring in the patient, the clinicians, and uh, industry, and uh, get everybody around the same table before approaching uh, the, the government uh, people and you know, showing them uh, the, the real test case of what we we ought to see in the system. And the other way to understanding the individual needs of each of the stakeholders. And that is uh, something we need to know for clinicians, what do they want? What are their challenges in being able to take care of the rare disease community and being able to find solutions and offering those solutions to the clinicians and helping them make their work pretty easier. 
and for policymakers as well. They need the data and so uh, to take the decision. So uh, being able to mobilize the data which is actionable and meaningful uh, that could help them take the next decisions uh, are some of the strategies that we uh, adopted. So to the trainings and all of them, we're able to bring everybody on the same table to start thinking about how we, we can resolve uh, the, the problems. The most important thing we made them understand what will happen if we don't work now. Uh, we are crying about resources, but it means that we'll be crying more if we don't pass now. Thank you very much, Sam. You know, and it's really, I think, um, reinforcing from several directions, right, what it is that I think, uh, you know, Rana, you've kind of put together in terms of having certainly the strong leadership, but also being able to get together all the stakeholders. So being WFH, I think you have some natural advantages in terms of already having sort of good practice guidelines and having kind of the international community. So let me ask, you know, uh, really going back to, you know, Rosalind and maybe Christine as well, you know, so you both start as parents you know, with real passion and seeing the need for getting access to diagnosis and getting access to specialists, you know, have you been able to, and do you see that as an important in channel it's in terms of finding um, other stakeholders, including the professionals, including policymakers who can help you make the case in order to be able to affect change? Um, maybe, I don't know, Christine or Rosalind, you want to take that on in terms of what uh, you see as the role in terms of bringing in the other stakeholders and how do you get them to kind of really be champions for you? Okay, let me go first. Um, we've seen a difference in terms of, as we've grown as individuals, we've learned to advocate for ourselves, we've learned to advocate for other members, but now we're learning to advocate and look into policies with other stakeholders. So we need to empower our individual members to do to be where we were so that we can grow as an organization. So the key thing is we cannot do this alone. And we all know passion does run out at some point. So we have to have structures and policies in place to make sure that even for our children's children, that there is a difference. Rosalyn and I were talking about today morning about, is there a difference you're making? Can we see it? But if you look at it, retrospectively, yes. And our children's children will actually get to benefit for the fact that there are rare disease conversations happening. Rosalind, would you agree? I mean, the idea is to kind of get more patients and more advocates and more families speaking up, but also then being able to impact um, others who can help advance your message and maybe getting into some of the policy changes. Yes, true. Um, I, I, I totally agree with what Christine is saying, but more so we also um, bring into the fold the government because we can't do much without the policy and um, uh, from top down, you know, like from uh, policies and programs that actually, um, you know, address the challenges that people living with rare diseases are having and actually the awareness that the government has that there are people living with rare diseases and then also the healthcare workers. So. We've had the chance to talk with several, and sometimes even when we see um, something happening, maybe in the rare disease, like maybe a major function or a major conference, we're always sending it to them, uh, sending them, oh, there's this, and they can be able to plug in, be able to be able to see that child that probably they've been trying to figure out what's going on, and they have, and it has been a good um, understanding and a, a, like a give and take, and it they do actually see the importance of that when we work together as, as, as opposed to the top down and doctors up there and patient organizations are a bit lower. So that has helped in bringing everybody to the table to discuss uh, rare diseases as a country for us. And I know you're planning a, uh, a Kenya conference coming up shortly. I just thought I'd give you a chance to promote it. Yes. So the first time this year, uh, we will have for the first time in the country um, a workshop that will address uh, challenges of rare diseases in the country. We'll talk about the definition, which we did not have as a country, the need for that definition, the need for a registry, and how do we go you know, beyond that. So it's a, a, a conversation that we are very excited about, and we want to bring everyone, we will of course bring in even the international community, to tell us how they did theirs, and what can we borrow and contextualize you know, in our context. 
<laughs> Great. Thank you so much. And this is my perfect opportunity to pivot over to you, Kelly, uh, because I really, you know, find that, um, you know, you started way back. You hosted one of the first international conferences on rare diseases in Africa, and you have been very active in terms of trying to engage all of the other levels. Um, it, maybe I'll go to kind of what the heart is here. We've now got a United Nations uh, declaration on rare diseases, recognizes that rare diseases is in fact, in fact an important sector, and also recognizes that beyond just the medical and clinical, it is in fact um, an important issue for impacting social, economic, et cetera. Do you feel, and I know you worked very hard in terms of getting support for this declaration, do you feel that having this declaration is going to help you in terms of what you've been able, you know, you're doing, and, you know, in terms of trying to get the attention of policymakers, trying to get the attention of the uh, professionals? Um, how would this, how can this resolution help you? And what are you going to do with it now? So there's no doubt that uh, uh, this sort of legislation, for lack of a better word, is um, is a big stick in which you can use to actually leverage at government level. Um, unfortunately, Africans have a way of doing things the African way. Um, so we still have a lot of work to do as in the African continent in terms of the African Union. But having the United Nations Declaration really, really gives us some form of guideline and it gives us a top down approach that we can use um, to leverage and to create change. Um, but unfortunately, we still have to do a lot of work from the bottom up. Um, but I think also other than giving us the leverage, it gives us a, from, a, from our own institutional perspectives, it gives us guidelines in terms of what we really should be advocating and fighting for within our own particular countries and regions. And I think for many of us who have landed in the situation and we've heard it here on this panel, you come into the situation based on personal circumstances. It's not like we all you know, decided that this is what we wanted to do for a career. Um, we've landed up doing it out of personal situations and passion. And so we're not necessarily always uh, the most knowledgeable in terms of the best way to advocate or the best way to change policy. So having these sorts of declarations and being given the opportunity as a collective to work towards these sorts of declarations really helps us strengthen our own expertise um, in terms of what we should be focusing on and how we should do it, which I think is is equally as, valu as valuable as having that big um, leverage stick. Brilliant. So really, it's there and it's there for you to leverage it and it provides you with the opportunity to get the attention for it. But it's still the work from the bottom up, but also learning from others. So if you don't mind, Roberta, I'm going to kind of come to you with somewhat the same thing. As you said, uh, Argentina is one of the first countries um, in Latin America and maybe around the world to actually pass a law on rare diseases. But as you said, 2011, it's now, you know, 10, 11 years later, we now have a U UN declaration on rare diseases you know, diseases. Um, is this going to be a help to you? And what, how do you see, you know, that you might be able to use it in terms of advancing um, the access to better care and treatment for patients with rare diseases in, in Argentina and in the region? It's really very difficult for us because the law is mostly 10 years and sometimes it, it doesn't happen anything because nobody respects the law. Uh, for different reasons, and we have a um, we have a very huge country. We have a very fragmentation health system, so it is very difficult to reach and and get in all the areas, as as Lara mentioned uh, before, uh, to have a, an early diagnosis and and to have a specialist and and, and a good center of care. But I think that all that we are doing with your help, with RDI and all the groups in regional and, and international uh, helps us to, to, to have a transparent work, to, to try to, to get the good practices, to, to, to have the, the, the transfer, the capacity of different organizations around the world that brings up um, the, the, the right tools to, to, to work together with the Minister of Health. It's a hard work, but it's the most important goal that as the Argentine Federation we have, and, and, and also we are in some way an inspiration for other rare diseases and uh, groups in, in Latin America. Uh, you have to have a very a good group as, as uh, uh, different persons here in the panel says, a, a great team, 
uh, also work with uh, very closely with the professional, the medical societies. And I think that all together working and, and also I think that we need also that the, that the general population understands uh, what the, uh, um, what the uh, resolution, uh, UN resolution uh, has been adopted, because I think it's, uh, it's something very important that they know the importance of all these concepts that were approved in the resolution, because they will allow to work together, obviously, prioritizing uh, at the concrete action in the middle and long term also. And I think that is uh, something very important for all the umbrellas organizations in, in our case for, for the Latin American countries, that we have a great talent is to, to work all together with the individual organizations to try to find the common objectives, to try to present ourselves to the decision makers uh, as, a, um, as an ally community, a constructive and a solid uh, community to, to try to collaborate, but that the, all the, the, the consolidations of the actions plans really improve the, the reality of, of the people living with their families, uh, with rare diseases and their families. I think that is a, is, a, is a great and big and difficult challenge, but I think that working all together uh, is going to be possible. It's amazing what you're saying, Robert. I mean, Federal has a huge reputation, obviously, in terms of being a regional leader. But it sounds like what you're saying also is that being able to raise up other you know, countries and other mm -hmm. associations also contributes to the work that you're doing. So it creates that kind of regional movement there, which is maybe a perfect opportunity to go to you, Carmen Sita, because I know that um, I've seen you in many you know, of the other conferences, and I know that you are you know, seen as a real role model across um, the other um, Southeast Asian countries in terms of the work that you're doing, certainly specifically around, you know, the genetics, the newborn screening, et cetera, but also in terms of advancing uh, rare diseases. What's it like for you and, and how valuable has it been to be able to have other um, professionals or other policymakers within that Asia Pacific region or in the Southeast Asian region in terms of working collaboratively. Have you seen changes? How's it actually advanced? Well, I always use um, experiences from other countries to show my government that we're behind. So I like meetings like this to show them that there are things that they can do better. The UN resolution has been a very important uh, document for me. I just uh, met the all the medical societies in uh, in the Philippines, uh, bringing them together to to come up with a, the, the the registry for those to be funded. So that was my primary document that I used for that that particular meeting. My next set of meetings will be for the other government agencies to come on board. So in addition to the legislation now, I have the UN, I have the resolution now to say that we're not alone. It's a, it's a whole, it's a whole new whole world around us telling us that this is the right thing to do. It's very challenging. I think it, I share all the sentiments of the people in the panel that uh, legislation is one, getting it implemented is another. It's it's really teamwork. I'm lucky I'm with the university. I have a team of geneticists working with me, but at the same time, I have parents joining me. So I'd like to give a big role to the parents who have been beside me in lobbying for many things. But definitely the UN uh, resolution has been a big boost to me. And as I said, I had just a meeting and everybody says, yes, it's time for us to work on this one together. So it gives great legitimacy to what you're saying and also the breadth of what you're doing. Tell me a little bit about your um, collaborations you know, across the Southeast Asian region, though, because I know you do a lot as well with other geneticists and other providers. Yes. So we do have a, a network of geneticists in the region. And uh, being clinical geneticists, we, we basically de deal with the same kind of patients. We have a network of uh, uh, clinicians also and geneticists working on newborn screening. So together we actually share good experiences and challenges and we sort of like support each other. We bring around the conference, uh, we take turns every two to three years and we make sure that our government is present in these conferences. So sharing experiences across the region actually is very powerful. And we have we have committed ourselves to making this happen for our part of the world. Because to be alone, you know, in your country is very difficult. But when you're part of a network in the region that's going to be powerful and being part of an international network is even 
more useful and powerful for me back in the Philippines. So I really thank this network at RDI and Rohane because this has been very useful for me as a, the lobbyist back home in the Philippines. So thank you. Thank you to the, to the organization. You're very modest in terms of what your leadership role is. I'm trying to make, you know, you kind of take a little bit more credit for what you do, but you always kind of push it into everybody else. So kudos to everything that you're doing. Um, we're almost going to be out of time. I want to give everybody a chance to really talk about what else that you would expect. What can we do at the international community level? Now that you've raised it, conversation, how can we help, you know, better? And that might also include, you know, the international patient uh, organizations as well. How can we do a better job? to help support the efforts at the national level, at your local level, with the UN resolution or declaration or any other things that we might do. And maybe, you know, um, I'll go back over to you, Samuel. You know, uh, you are really, you know, not only, uh, as you say, with rare disease, the gun initiative, but that was the most recent in terms of hosting, you know, an African summit. Um, is there, are there some very specific, if you had one wish, for what you think the international community could or should be doing to help you in your efforts, what would you ask for? Thank you. I I would wish for uh, improvement on access, access, uh, access to everything for red disease. Uh, many patients in developing countries and low middle income countries do not have same opportunity uh, organizations in low middle income countries do not have the same opportunity uh, as others in uh, uh, developed countries uh, funding grants are usually accessible and uh, the patients are not getting diagnosis they are not getting treatment and many of the information available are not uh, and are not translated or converted into consumable information for patients in any low in middle income country. So I'm actually pushing for improvement and access. access. I appreciate very much what you're saying is that, you know, from an international level, focusing on equity of access, and that may be access for, for everything. And we also appreciate how much you're doing to actually contribute to that effort. So thank you very much. Laura, do you mind if I go to you? I mean, you have, as you said, now setting up by Early Diamond Society as an international initiative. And but what from the international community, from the rare disease international community, you know, broader that, how can we help what you're doing in terms of trying to advance, um, you know, EDS, but, you know, um, you know, in your work and especially, you know, in addressing low middle income uh, countries? I think consistency in the message of what I said earlier, that, that those therapies need to be offered for life. Um, it needs to come out of that short term thinking, but also really putting forth the message that it needs to be both physical therapies and those therapies for mental health, because coming to terms and living with a rare disease is a lot to deal with and there's often no cure there's often no treatments at all and to deal with that and learn how to live with that for the rest of your life that mental health offering is just rarely given at the point of diagnosis so helping make that a consistent message across the world no matter where you're living it would be great to get to a point where geography and wealth don't determine your quality of life and access to diagnosis that is so brilliant and certainly i think you know as a rare disease international community, we have not actually paid as much attention, as you say, to the mental health and mental health needs and bolstering those, but also, as you say, the sustainability and in whatever initiatives are in place. So thank you very much of that. And, and like Samuel, I know you're doing a great deal to contribute to that. So maybe I'll follow in that line and go to you, Raina. You know, WFH is, we see it as one of our leaders. So we look to you guys for actually being the pioneers in terms of putting together programs. But is there anything we could do from the global rare disease community that would also be most supportive of WFH work and especially in terms of low and middle income uh, countries? Thank you, Darren. Um, when I look at the resolution, I um, see three key points there. One is about strengthening health systems and national programs. These are paragraphs one, seven, and eight. 
And then I look at the um, paragraph three, which talks about the stigma and taboo. And then I look at paragraphs five and six, which essentially talk about data collection. So three key issues, you know, national programs, stigma and taboos, and data collection. Now, how does WFH deal with some of those? You know, our vision is about treatment for all, tackling issues that you've all raised about inequities, about uh, lack of access to treatment and so on. And the way we do it is that we have a comprehensive development model that, have, that has six interrelated pillars that go from government support through care delivery, through increasing medical expertise, through lobbying, advocating for better treatment products, through capacity building to build the patient organizations, all the way to data collection. So my sort of uh, view on, on the best way forward is, is to keep looking at the resolution, as uh, Kelly said, as, as the key framework that guides the work of uh, the different people on the ground, to uh, do what Christine and Rosalind said, you know, to keep looking for those allies, basically to keep talking as a one united voice for the patient groups and the healthcare professionals to work hand in glove. This is the very only way. There is no other way. Advocating in one voice. If that voice is broken, then the listening ear is lost, essentially. And then to focus strongly on data collection, to build the evidence, to show uh, policymakers how health outcomes can be improved, how the quality of life for persons with uh, rare disorders can be changed, you know, not just from a physical point of view, but what Lara said also from a social, psychosocial point of view as well, and taking all that forward as a package. You know, capitalizing on the networks, international, regional, local, not missing a single opportunity, doing it all. It takes a lot, uh, lot of effort, but it, it works. Thank you. I'm going to just say we, we're totally out of time, but I'm going to give maybe an opportunity for Kelly and then for uh, Rosalind and Christine also to come back with one thing that you would want from the international rare disease community. Kelly. Um, I think just awareness of healthcare literacy and an understanding that first world countries often uh, do things in a much more advanced mannerism, um, which makes it quite difficult for us on the ground as advocates in relatively nascent settings to have a firm understanding. So I think if we could all be cognizant of, of the language, the type of language that's used uh, and making material a little bit more adaptable uh, to grassroots levels, I think would be great. And that's, this is really why it's so important to have people who are working at the grassroots levels to be able to be that intermediary in translation. So I'm going to go to Christina and Rosalind. Either one of you can go first. You get one wish out of this. And you don't have to share the wish, but you get a wish. We get to Awesome. <laughs> um, for me, it's capacity building in the sense that um, we are young in this rare disease uh, patient advocacy group journey. And it should be best if we like had um, not reinvent the wheel, basically. So have somebody show us this is where we're supposed to do, show, show our government this is where we are headed. This is how the future looks like. Because as individuals, you cannot go very far, but together we'll go very far. Thank you so much. And that is really something that um, we are trying to, I think, do better. Rosalind, to you. For me, it's uh, a bit of what also Christine said, is that uh, to also empower uh, patient groups. So like Christine said, uh, both of us came into this uh, from a different lifestyle and having to advocate and learning what that even means for ourselves, that, that's something new. And um, we're still learning and we, we wish that that could be, be able to help even others, like just help us understand what it means to just advocate and do all this for others. <laughs> It's brilliant. And what we've all, I think, recognized from this is that, as you say, we can't just do it from the top and having all the legislation and all the national and international you know, declarations and programs there, they are meaningless unless there are leaders and there are people on the ground. But what you're also saying is that if you're going to do that, listen to the people on the ground, empower the people on the ground, because it actually does work differently there. The language is different there. The understanding is different there. So this has been a tremendously valuable kind of a encounter. I can't thank you folks enough for coming and sharing your expertise, sharing your experience 
experience, but also really, you know, providing the kind of recommendations that we need as an international community. And most of all, those sharing your commitment to work together. Thank you so much. This couldn't have been a more brilliant discussion. Really, really appreciate it. And certainly, I think we all appreciate the work that you're doing. So thank you again. I'm going to ask um, those of the with the panel that are here um, in the audience to come up and be part of the panel. And it's your opportunity now to bombard them with your hardest questions. These are veterans. These are people that have been there. You've heard them brag about their experiences. Now is the time for them to be able to share with you what it is that you want to know. So thank you again very much. Okay, it, uh, questions here. And we ha do have, I think, a couple of questions online that we might ask, but I'm going to turn it over to people who are here. Would anybody like to start with a question to, you may ask it to a person in general, you may ask a question that everybody can answer. Rachel? Oh, great. All right, we've got a volunteer here. Hi. <laughs> um, kudos to all of you for doing a fantastic job um, doing um, servicing your communities. I'm just curious, what is your single most proud achievement in your, each of your jurisdiction or disease groups? <laughs> <laughs> wow, well, you can take a moment. <laughs> no pressure there. Um, I think for me, there, there is something really, really indescribable about a new patient getting approved for some form of treatment that has previously been unavailable to them. Um, and I don't think that that's anything I've been lucky enough to experience it more than once. So it's the gift that keeps on giving. But um, I don't really think that there's anything more meaningful to, to this work than having that opportunity. For me, I think it has to, to be the realization that going global was absolutely the right thing. Seeing the decades of neglect um, before the Ellis Danos Society was launched in 2015, 2016, and how much has been done in the last five years because everyone just came together. Everyone realized that together you're stronger. That, that wonderful African proverb, if you want to go um, far, um, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And it's so true. And I think the proudest thing has, has been to have the privilege of being the CEO of an organization that really has been trailblazing in, in that way in terms of research, building coalitions, building registries. Um, it's been a joy to be part of. Yeah, for me, uh, it's when I look back before we started to now, having been able to create a hub or a resource for uh, where a family can be directed, say, we have a, a clinician is a patient and it's a rare disease. They know where to direct the patient and the family to. That didn't exist before then, but now we have. And for me, that is the, the joy that I have seeing that families are not lost as it were before. They have somewhere they can go and get some resources, some answers and some form of uh, support. And that's for me the greatest achievement. Um, for me, it's eight years ago when I went online and I Googled what rare disease day is all about, decided that Kenya is going to start doing rare diseases and look at myself then and now and seeing the growth that you've done, the strides you've made, the organization you formed, the, the lives you've changed, that is just mind blowing. And for me, it's um, twofold. That one, you get to see um, people who've been looking for a diagnosis, and then finally, um, you're able to direct them. Maybe it's a doctor that they needed to see that probably they've been seeing the wrong specialty, and then now they actually get the diagnosis. Yes, it's it's you know bittersweet. You've gotten it. Now the work begins. And then on the other hand, like Christine says, the way we've come now, we've reached to the point of policy and being able to push for that and be able to sit with the government on the table and say, okay, this is what needs to be done. And they actually listen and they're actually working together with it. So that that is huge. That's wonderful. Another question. Yes. 
We have one coming in from the chat uh, online. So what are some easy ways for an individual citizen to raise their awareness or their community's awareness about the challenges faced by people living with a rare disease? Okay, let me just take a couple people that can do that easy way, she says. <laughs> you might just well go home by now, right? <laughs> the easy and hard way. How do you get awareness? Um, start with your family. Start with your neighbors. Start with your community. And as you grow wider, you'll share the message. So somebody else. Yeah, I think uh, from my perspective, it's it's to continuously re, um, reiterate the same messaging. So I think you get a lot more traction when you all collectively come towards the same objective than splitting and everyone trying to do their own little bits. Get everybody to say the same message, and that makes it a very louder message. Okay, Laurie, you look like you want to say I, something. <laughs> I don't know if you can see me back there. I see you. I, you're very seeable. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not. Um, so I just want to say social media. I mean, what a powerful tool. It's it's a place where, that sometimes I hate, and but also I'm very grateful for because you reach people through hashtagging, through um, aligning yourself with other organizations. But I think it's very important to remember when you're raising awareness, what responsibility you have, because many of us are either advocates living with a rare disease, parents of people with rare diseases. And when you're then in a position where you're raising that awareness, you have to remember you're not just telling your story. It's not just your narrative. And so you have to make sure you're representing all the different experiences and everything along the spectrum from either just your one condition or many conditions that you may be representing and I think that's a really important thing to remember and it's it's much harder than it looks to do because you have to learn so much and many of us didn't choose this right we we, we just ended up here and um it's a lot of responsibility and hard work but it's worth it great okay Shirley thanks I think my question goes on from this a little bit um so you know, you've raised some incredible insights into your experiences and, and you've just said that, you know, many of us didn't choose this. We didn't choose the world of advocacy. We came into it through own personal experiences. And I often say that at this particular moment, I see that we're at a historical moment in terms of rare disease advocacy. You know, there's a lot of change that has occurred over the last 20 years. There's a lot of change in terms of how diagnosis is happening, there's a lot of change in terms of the advocacy world. And so I guess I want to push you a little bit in terms of what do you see needs to happen now in terms of how we do advocacy for rare disease? Um, and what do you think maybe needs to change, especially when we start to think about young people who are now reaching adulthood who have had a diagnosis since two, three, how do we assure that there is strong self-advocacy, what's the future there for advocacy? It's a hard question, all mm. right. Okay. <laughs> not, not just do more of what you're doing, do it harder. <laughs> Shirley says, what do you, what do we to change now? And especially if we're bringing younger people in so that they can also become advocates. Yep, okay. <laughs> it's difficult to see who. Um, so I think, I think one of the, biggest things and and like Laura was saying with regards to responsibility is teaching people how to empowering them to be able to advocate for themselves and I think when you come into the situation particularly for us who come in from passion or circumstance um, your desire to want to help people and make it easier for them um, leads you towards doing things for them initially and I think one of the biggest learnings that I've experienced is to give them the tools to be able to do it themselves because your mom might not be there to advocate for you forever. Um, and um, little mice can make a lot of noise. And I always, I look at my own son um, and I see how he has now developed the ability to be able to ask for improved pain medication, um, you know, explain to doctors what he wants and what he's not comfortable with anymore. And I know that by having given him that, that he will be a much stronger patient in the long run because he's had the ability to find his own voice. I would, I would add to that that I, I think that there are so many opportunities to uh, kind of get more skills as an advocate. You, Patty, uh, through your audience, there's um, 
the toolkits through Global Genes. There's lots of different opportunities where advocates can learn more um, about how best to do this. But I also think that, that what you mentioned, we're at this crossroads where I think um, it's taken so long to really push forth the, the notion that patient engagement and patient advocacy is so essential. And that term patient expert, patient engagement, we've worked so hard for so many years to get to a point where people recognize that. And I feel like we're at a crossroads where is that the right term? Because actually you're only a patient when you're in front of a doctor. We're so much more than just a patient, we're humans, we're people who have so many different experiences that make us advocates. And I think that, um, that, that having that word patient always associated with you gives you an identity that I don't think is fair. So I also think at this moment where we've got a lot more awareness on the importance of patient engagement, remembering that that perhaps is not the most appropriate word. So I, I don't know the answer to that because we've taken so long to get to this point, but I think it's worth exploring. And I think it's worth remembering we're, we're a lot more than patients. Yeah, and I, I also think that we need to think uh, of advocates in terms of how folk it could be, in terms of what I, how we would advocate, say, in Africa or in Asia, maybe very different from how advocacy would be in Europe and in, uh, in America or in other areas. So in advocacy, we need to also think about the how folk and be very adaptable in terms of knowing what works and what doesn't work and be able to change where necessary. And uh, but regards to uh, young people, I, I say we need to always think about the transition uh, of uh, when we are advocating. We need just not need to advocate that uh, uh, just at the point of just diagnosis, then knowing that after diagnosis, there is a need for treatment and from treatment, there is an there is a growth that goes on with the child growing from, from the person growing from a child to an adult who then they have different needs that will also happen. So we need to factor all of these needs into, into uh, consideration when we advocate. Those are wonderful because we are talking about needing to be context appropriate. We need to be culture appropriate. But I will really realize what we don't have here. We need a group of teens. We need a group of young people. We're all too old to do this. So where are my young people? So that's a really, really powerful point. Thank you. One other question. Did you want to bring? Yes. yes. Uh, from a line. So what are some of the synergies or similarities uh, that potentially can be leveraged from the rare disease advocacy work? work um, with that of chronic diseases. To other chronic so what can we learn from maybe chronic disease advocacy efforts that can be leveraged and used for rare diseases? Okay. So have you picked up anything from what other chronic diseases have done that you've been able to incorporate into your own advocacy work and don't go HIV? <laughs> you may not. <laughs> don't go HIV. It's too easy. Cancer. <laughs> Cancer. Okay, Registry. go ahead. Yes. Registry. So, so what did you learn? Like in Kenya, we want to see how to want to benchmark with the cancer registry because we don't have one and see how they did it and how we can do ours. Great. So providing the data, getting a registry, being able to provide numbers, others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, diagnostics. I was going to reiterate what Christine had said, um, access to diagnostics. Um, I think a lot of that work that has happened before us for the more common conditions has made it somewhat easier. But I also think it's important to realize your rights and responsibilities as a patient. And that often comes from more common, well-known diseases. I think with EDS, we're um, quite unique in the fact that there's um, 13 published types. We now know there's 14 types of EDS and all of them are rare and ultra rare, but hypermobile EDS, as we're learning, may actually be more rarely diagnosed and, and a bit more prevalent. So we're dealing with kind of that chronic world as well as the rare disease world. And hypermobile EDS, it can be quite similar in presentation to fibromyalgia, um, uh, uh, chronic pain syndrome, chronic fatigue. And, and unfortunately, that, that world is as muddy as ours is. And I think it's because of that a multi-systemic presentation being bounced from doctor to doctor, lack of funding, lack of awareness. And I truly think that diagnostics and understanding that you can see a doctor and not just report one symptom. You know, a doctor needs to see that whole picture and look at you holistically to really understand what's going on. And I think that actually there's even more uh, struggles with the chronic landscape as there is with the rare. 
that's brilliant. Thank you so much. And I know that um, certainly across many of the developed worlds, EDS is showing the way in terms of multi-systemic. You know, so you know, you folks have done an amazing job in terms of raising awareness that it isn't just one thing. And we all have had the experience where you go in and see your clinician says you can ask me about one thing, and the answer, the response is it isn't just one thing. So that's brilliant. Thank you. I do think that we have come out of our time, and so I wish we. We probably should have started with this, then we didn't need to record any panels. We could have just had the discussion. So that was no, actually, it helped us a great deal. You folks are brilliant. We're so, so, so pleased that you were able to come and join us here in Dubai and to not only just share your experiences, but also to be able to engage and interact with each other. So thank you very, very much. We are truly at the end and a little bit over time. So what I'm going to do actually is hopefully Anders is here somewhere in another space. <laughs> How about that? Are you ask if he appears. <laughs> okay, Anders, it's going to be over to you. I'm going to ask you to kind of give us a couple of uh, a, a minutes of a wrap up here to send us home and then we'll close it out. Okay. Thank you, Duran. Thank you, all the panel and I for the same, as you said, thank you for being there. But Technically, we can be anywhere at the same time as I am with you, even if I'm here. My, my spirit and my soul is with you in Dubai. To do a final remarks after a day like this is absolutely close to impossible. So many important actors are showing your support and showing that together we can do everything, anything. Hearing all these persons from our Red Disease community early today has really moved my heart. Hearing mothers, hearing people with the disease themselves talk about how it is, how their real life is from the different uh, corner of the globe has really moved my heart today. So it's become so important that we are global and now time is right. We have heard Fantastic with all these member states that have supported us and supporting us. It was great seeing Jan in, in Paris to see that Paris, what's happening in Paris is also important to us. And to listen what WHO and what UNESCO and other actors within the United Nations say that they really want to cooperate together with us on a global agenda. That is fantastic. All refer to resolution, but resolution is not the goal itself. Resolution is the door for the road ahead. And now it's time to act for us. I foresee that our resolution really can make a difference on member state level. I hope and I would like to promise you that when we celebrate the fifth global event, next event, we can see practical effects effects from today's member state level and for persons with a rare disease and families on their everyday level. We learned that the problem is the same all over the world, but the solution are designed different, which is a richness to us all to understand the whole picture of rare disease, to understand the difference culturally and financially is important for a global movement. Thank you all for your true commitment and honest work. It's amazing to see, hear, and learn from you. Your testimonies is really needed today when part of our world is dark. Please don't forget our Red Disease Day celebration in 90 minutes from now. Then we will meet persons from all over the all corners of the world again. So again, from my heart, I say, Thank you very, very much. And then I give it back to you, Duran, to close the day. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Anders. Your vision continues to light away for us, and we look forward to it. I know Anders also has some additional challenges up his sleeve, and I know that Flaminia has some additional real work for us to do. So this is not goodbye. This is not thank you. You're not dismissed. We're all, <laughs> we're all in this together. And it is really true. There is no community like the rare disease community. There is no community that brings in people that are family members, parents, patients coming together at every single level. And now, of course, we've got 
royalty listening to us. We've got the international leaders listening to us. They're part of our community. And I don't know any other community that can claim what it is that the rare diseases has been able to do. And it's really been done by the rare disease community. So I guess it's congratulations to all of us in terms of where we are today. So thank you again. So thanks to us. Okay, just to say, as Andrew says, we have an evening celebration that starts in about 90 minutes. You can get onto it through our Facebook Live, and you can also be able to come back into the channel that we've had. So make sure you come back. We will be able to celebrate, and certainly we look forward to the opportunity to kind of see you again at the next event. There are a number of events that are coming up for the rest of the year, so do follow up with us, and we look forward to being at your event. So don't forget to invite us. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank all of you for being here today.